Hi there, this is now a video on Monopoly, I mean the screencast on Monopoly, uh, the second concept of the four that we are going to cover this week. Let's start with what Monopoly is. Monopoly is basically a case of a single firm dominating the whole industry. So the market power in this industry is the key to uh, the definition. So um, one single firm uh, has the uh, has power of manipulating or ma controlling its prices as a result of demand for product. And uh, for the sake of practicality, let's define that a monopoly is a company that has a market power or has a share of market share of between 75 to 100 percent. Well, um, then. Let's assume that the monopoly uh, has. Let's assume there is a monopoly and uh, the firm controls seventy five percent of the market. Well, in that case, it's not necessarily a monopoly at all because monopoly implies one single firm in the uh, industry. But here, with the seventy five percent of market share, you are allowing other firms to take uh, uh, to compete with you. Yeah, and if a company has seventy five percent of the market share, but then there are a few other firms who own the remaining two, who manage the remaining. 25% of the market, then it's a contestable market. So monopoly is is not a theoretically um, uh, relevant here in this case. Yeah, concept of monopoly is not. But for the for practicality reasons, we usually think of monopolies uh, controlling uh, sort of a huge uh, having a huge power, uh, a massive power over other firms in the market. And another thing is important thing is that the Firms not necessarily monopolize the markets, uh, all markets where they operate. For example, Microsoft operates in uh, in many industry, in many different industries. Uh, it has this uh, Skype, for example. It has uh, operating system. It has uh, Internet Explorer. It has mobile phone. The one, and the only uh, uh, the industry where it is monopoly is the Microsoft Office industry. Uh, sorry, uh, the operating systems and word processing industry. And in other industries, it doesn't have that huge power to unleash on the rest of the firms in the market. So definition of monopoly gets a bit muddy. In, in this case, there's little boundary between what's monopoly and what's not when it comes to practical aspects. But you can see different books have diff different definitions. So that's why you might get confused. And if you think that the lecturer didn't tell you about this, that's for a reason, because they are probably sticking to one single book definition. OK, uh, let's go on to. Uh, as uh, some practical aspect of how we determine what monopoly is uh, or who, how we judge whether the industry is monopolized or not. Uh, we usually uh, assess it by looking at concentration ratios, especially uh, the most strict one is the five firm ratio. That's we take the uh, five largest companies in, in a specific industry and then we uh, measure their market share relative to the whole market. Uh, these are now industries listed in front of you in your screen uh, sugar industry to furniture industry and if you look at the five firm ratio concentration ratio as you can see sugar industry is dominated by top five firms that's because 99 percent of the share market is dominated by these five firms and uh, tobacco industry the same tobacco products industry is the same 99 firms uh, oh, sorry, 99% of the whole market is dominated by this single uh, a set of five firms only. So this is more like a monopoly, monopoly in this case. But you can think of them as an oligopoly as well because five large firms, yeah? We'll define that later. Uh, if you go down along these uh, by reading row by row, you'll see that the mostly competitive firm so industry is, is the furniture industry, but probably because of that we have cheaper furniture sometimes in, in the UK. You, know, you can buy a, ten, a, a piece of uh, a table, for example, for a £10 you know, in, in sale, for example. That, that's because there's a huge competition in the market. Okay, um, if you go backwards, obviously the competitiveness declines. So alcoholics 50% so about 50% of the industry is dominated by largest five firms in the UK that's 2004 by the way uh, by now probably uh, 13 years old looking forward you will have uh, some changes in the industry but I guess the there is uh, there is there is no study as of now uh, assessing this so this is a quite an old information but just for practical reasons or for demonstration reasons this is a useful one Okay, let's move on to the 15 firm ratio. As you can see, the pitch is slightly different here. Now we're looking at the share of the 15 largest companies in the whole industry. Again, sugar industry is still dominated by this 
a handful of firms. Um, in fact, the uh, the shares rise as we increase the firm size up with the number of firms in there. Yeah? So that's another method. But then this is not very strict. Strict measure of monopoly would usually be used five firm ratio or even two, three firm ratios. Yeah. So as you can see, then the competitiveness declines as larger firms uh, dominate uh, uh, more, more of the market. Okay, that's a uh, way of looking at, uh, in practice, practical terms, I mean, way of looking at uh, how monopolized the market is or how competitive the markets are. Next, let's go to the conceptual aspect of this uh, tool, oh, sorry, uh, topic. How to maintain monopoly. Uh, there is always, in, in, in any economy now, there is a competition policy committee where the government usually tries to control the, uh, the behavior of or monitor the behavior of firms and, and sometimes uh, firms behave sort of uh, in, a mono, in a way that allows them to gain market share. And once they gain market share, how could they maintain monopoly, for example, in this market? For example, how could Microsoft maintain its monopoly? Or how could BAE, the British Aeronautical Engineering Company that produces the uh, defense industry goods, could maintain its dominant position in the UK? There are a number of ways to do that. Uh, to survive in the monopoly, the firms will have to have uh, economies of scale. So they have to take advantage of economy scale by producing their products at very low costs. Large firms can do that definitely, for sure, because they could invest in research and development that eventually reduces, find the most efficient way of producing it, and they can produce large volumes in smaller costs per unit costs and can give sale at low costs as well. That means a, a new entrant will find it difficult to come to the business or to enter the market. So BAE is an example here. Now economies of scope, is a, it, it is a case where a firm is able to produce not single but many different uh, versions of a product or many different products and range of products. As a result its uh, fixed costs can be spread over a large amount of goods. For example, Colgate Palmolive, Palmolive produces many different toiletries, not a single one. And by advertising one or two at a very expensive advertising, for example, channel, for example, maybe on TV, they are able to then spread the cost across many ranges rather than just, for example, if they advertise a toothpaste, certain range of toothpaste for a million pound, the cost of produce, advertising toothpaste may be a million, uh, sorry, uh, if it's a million pound, it can easily spread the, this fixed cost over many different ranges rather than allocating this cost onto just the range that they are advertising on the and that is on the uh, on this toothpaste range so instead for a small firm for example to penetrate into this toothpaste market they if they advertise on let's say a sky tv for a million pound uh, they will have to spread the cost of this advertising over just uh, what they produce that's the the, the single unit or single uh, single type of product, the uh, toothpaste. And their toothpaste as a result becomes more expensive relative to Colgate's because Colgate Palmolive is able to spread the cost over many units while this one, many different ranges and units of products, uh, let's say shampoos or toiletries, many different uh, shaving products and things like this. But the single firm that produces that single, the small firm that produces a single uh, type of product will find it difficult then to sell at low price because their fixed costs are huge. Yeah, so economy of scope allows monopoly to maintain its power as well. Uh, another uh, way of doing doing this or tool is to differentiate the products and uh, create that brand loyalty. You see that some Apple Apple uh, customers are crazy about buying Apple. Buying everything Apple, MacBook, Apple phone, Apple iPad, uh, iPhone, I, then you have this media players and Apple uh, other iCloud and things like this. Yeah? They keep buying it, that's because they're quite loyal. Apple has created that sort of uh, uh, vision for people basically that they, once they buy they feel this uh, emotional attachment to the business, uh, company and brand and they feel like they're part of the family, right? So Monopoly can do this by uh, uh, by uh, advertising, for example, or by creating, uh, investing in this uh, research and development and design, for example, is one other thing that makes it more different than the other products. So that creates that of, um, gives that uh, monopoly power to the Apple now, or 
many others. In fact, it's not. The Samsung and Apple make up the large, uh, take take up the large amount of market share, but still, uh, Apple maintains a huge power. So uh, that's one way of doing it: uh, monopoly maintenance, for example, or maintaining the monopoly differentiation and brand loyalty. Uh, next one in line is the uh, costs for established firm by creating that economies of scale or maintaining the economy of scale. They are able to reduce the costs even below the price for it. Sort of um, reduce, uh, try to, they can reduce the costs uh, in a way that doesn't allow the uh, new firms to enter the market. You know, a monopoly usually sells well above its cost but uh, that creates a super normal profit for the uh, existing firm. But as soon as a new firm tries to enter the market because there's a profit opportunity, the, the existing firm cuts the price to a level that is not possible uh, for the, uh, for the uh, small firm to do. You know, they cannot really reduce the price because the small firm cannot reduce the price below average cost for a long time. And in the end, they, if Foxconn can maintain it for a long time and I mean sell at a low cost for a long time, then uh, the small firm will have to leave the market and then Foxconn becomes, for example, the existing monopoly will remain as it is. And Foxconn is one of them. In China, this is a lot, one of the largest firms that supply um, electronic chips to Apple and, and many other, I think, many other uh, companies. Uh, and then new firms trying to enter the uh, mobile phone chip market will find it hard because Foxconn is able to offer the low cost, uh, low price. Uh, uh, products to Apple and others. So as a result, Apple always keeps buying from Foxconn. I think they, they had something to do with Foxconn in the past. I don't know if they are still suppliers, but back in the days it was, and it, Foxconn was the main supplier. Now, uh, monopoly power is also maintained if the mark, uh, if the company or the monopoly monopolist uh, uh, has a position, position of this ownership of uh, scarce resources or key factors, for example. Think of Aramco, Saudi Arabia's oil company. Uh, it is uh, it is monopoly in the oil market, and the reason is it owns the uh, largest reserve in Saudi Arabia, oil reserve in Saudi Arabia. Now, in, maybe it's the largest reserve in the world because it, it, Saudi Arabia is all, there is a single oil reserve called uh, Gavar in Saudi Arabia that basically pumps about thirty percent of all oil out. So that that is owned by Aramco as well. As a result, Aramco is is, is is a dominant supplier of oil in the market because of this uh, sort of ownership of the key uh, key outlets or key uh, key resource. Think of diamonds, for example. There is one company called uh, Devir. I don't remember the full name of this company, but it's Devir is basically a diamond company, um, and and one, it basically controls major uh, diamond uh, mining businesses, and so any mine uh, diamonds you buy basically will benefit Devir and its associated companies, uh, it maintains that monopoly power as a result. So the old money that you pay for diamonds will go indirectly to this company, uh, given that it maintains the power or control over these mining's in, uh, in Africa and around the world. So ownership of uh, or key control of key factors or outlets will allow the companies to maintain monopoly. Um, maybe that's why you will see that African company economies uh, or countries usually are uh, well, we usually say that African governments are corrupt or Asian governments are corrupt for a reason because the companies that these big companies usually bribe to possess uh, ownership of this or control over these the resources and in the end what happens is that they create monopoly in that region who benefits only the companies and as a result there's always riots and people don't benefit from monopoly because they just uh, keep sucking the cash out of these countries well uh, that's because of again there's a corruption in there but that's a case of how monopoly could be very damaging okay um, legal protection is another tool basically companies that uh, innovate usually uh, protect their uh, uh, innovations by patenting them for example Apple is usually uh, uh, the reason one example is that reason why Apple is dominant for example in mobile phone market or some others in, in not in the UK maybe but in America for example is because it's protected its designs by patenting them so any other company Im imitating them replicating Apple will be sued by the company and they are able to extract huge amount of cash from the, uh, the replicating company so it's hard to penetrate into Apple's uh, area of business for example 
or pharmaceutical companies, for example, to produce a drug as a new firm, you have to really uh, buy the patent to produce it, or you have to come up with a new way of producing it, or a new drug, for example, yeah? then that's a lot of cost. You know, you have to invest in research and development, uh, hire chemistry people or professors and things like this, and buy a huge amount of resources to test the drug and things like this, and it means huge expenses and firms may not enter the market as a result. So because the the existing drug types are now patented by other existing firms and only existing firms benefit from it. So monopoly doesn't let others to enter the market and that allows the monopoly companies to maintain the monopoly in the industry. Now mergers and takeovers is another option for uh, for the existing firms to maintain its uh, to use and maintain its monopoly power by threatening uh, uh, the smaller firms, so if a firm is uh, trying to is trying to enter the uh, industry of the uh, monopolized by a single firm, the monopoly company could easily buy this out or threaten to buy out the small firm, and as a result, again, the small firm cannot enter the market, and the monopoly power again remains in the hand of one or two firms. And aggressive tactics is another option or tool for maintaining monopoly. In this case. Uh, um, mere the mere chance or mere possibility of selling at a low cost for example uh, implies a new firm is not able to come in to the business you know even if they set up the business they they they, they, they broke the first barrier they invested huge amounts as a new firm and they started selling at 100 pound but the existing firm the monopolist now may decide to reduce the price to 50 pound compare the 100 pound new product new company that said a new company selling at you know the the product that's company selling now. Oof. Sorry. Uh, compare this hundred pound uh, and then fifty pound product. They are quite identical, but one produced by a smaller firm, one is by a big existing firm. Now the smaller firm will find it difficult to undercut that fifty pound price because the existing firm made it so slow, so that the existing or the new firm is not able to replicate or is not able to sell, basically. Yeah? When you have that huge differential in prices, customers keep buying from the existing company and the sales of the new company will dry out. So that implies this aggressive undercutting, price undercutting will help the monopolist. Because it has this economy scale now, by now, yeah? if the existing firm has just been there for about 10 years, it would have built that existing economies of scale. Uh, before this new com firm comes, or well, advertising another option, yeah, the existing firms can spend huge amount on advertising, while small firms may not be. So it will be very hard to enter or break this aggressive tactics, after all, um, given that the monopolists have this uh, power. So these are uh, a number of ways a firm can maintain its monopoly or the uh, supply of certain goods. Uh, keep in mind that the monopoly may not be a monopoly for the whole industry, but certain divisions of the markets, yeah? Divisions of the markets, not, not every, everywhere. As I said, uh, Microsoft is not a monopoly in every single industry, but only in uh, word processing business and I think uh, uh, operating system, for example, largely uh, dominated by these two, by monopoly, uh, sorry, by Microsoft. Okay, here is a quick question to you. Which one of the following would be a barrier to firms entering an industry? Take, say, 10 seconds to read and then try to answer it. Okay, as you can see, the, uh, the answers here. B, C, D, E are basically the concepts that or tools that we just discussed. So this A, uh, an un un upward sloping long run average cost curve is not a tool that allows uh, uh, becomes a barrier to entry. In fact, as a, a firm, a new firm can come up with a new innovative way that's not patented, that's not that uh, circumvents basically the, all the barriers to entry, and then can produce a lower cost, for example, yeah, and enter the market. So that's a. Now uh, let's look at how uh, where the equilibrium uh, profit maximizing output is, or how the uh, uh, how the uh, monopolists operate in the in the market in equilibrium. This is a short run analysis. Now, uh, monopolists uh, demand curve is unlike unlike the perfect competitors uh, competition firms uh, curve. It's downward sloping, and as usual, uh, average revenue is uh, represented by the demand curve. 
and that's also equal to price average one is equal to price now quantities are given there as you can see by the way monopolists do not have market market demand curve monopolist is only only market only 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 firm in the market so it, it its demand curve is the market demand curve so we think of this as an average revenue as a result so the quantities are in the x-axis as usual and then the monetary values are on the y-axis and you have some negative values for a reason here you will see now the schedule is just drawn here in blue now uh, well, let's draw the total revenue sorry the margin revenue margin revenue is the difference between the total revenues here so total revenue is revenue producing two units minus total revenue producing one unit gives us six pounds so that's the margin revenue from producing the extra unit and this reddish line here is the margin revenue line and notice that the margin revenue can be zero and a negative as well yeah it becomes a more, uh, loss as we produce beyond certain point uh, due to uh, diminishing margin returns to input now let's look at the uh, profit maximizing under monopoly now the rule stays the same as before uh, marginal cost equal margin revenue point is the uh, profit maximizing quantity sorry um, the rule for profit maximizing quantity is uh, where marginal cost equals margin revenue so we look at the, uh, the, the point where uh, point of production on x x axis here where the marginal e cost equals marginal revenue let's look at marginal cost curve the usual uh, sort of uh, uh, equal this j shape curve uh, with an increase initial decline in production and as the uh, diminishing returns kick in then the costs increase addition, additional unit costs increase and here is our marginal revenue curve from before from that last slide it's downward sloping and at the point where margin revenue equals margin cost is the uh, profit maximizing uh, is determines the profit maximizing unit qm and what price do they charge well it's the price that corresponds to that point so on the average curve yeah average revenue curve here so that will be the average revenue per unit at this point here when they produce qm units quantities now uh, by uh, uh, drawing now the average cost curve we can work out what the profit is for marginal uh, sorry for a monopolist company now usually monopolists usually uh, maintain huge supernormal profits and you can see this is a huge supernormal profit here um, the supernormal profit will be disappearing if average cost just kisses the average revenue but in this case it doesn't just for just for demonstration purposes this is what the monopolists do they produce at the point where marginal revenue and marginal cost equals but at a higher price at a much much higher price than the average cost curve entails yeah so the difference here between this uh, average cost and then sorry average revenue and average cost gives us the per unit cost times the quantity gives us the total uh, profit so this difference is profit i should say not the cost now the question is can they produce here because average cost is lower yes they can if they want to they still make a super super normal profit so if you just trace out here i um, mean if they give up this uh, this uh, rule and do not produce at this point but to produce here as possibility they can do that but however as you can see the triangle here that can be drawn will be lower uh, um, will be smaller well, the area of the triangle will be smaller because then total profit will be low obviously so they prefer and the result the monopolist rule will be this one they prefer producing here because the area of the triangle here is much higher than this one you can draw it on a piece of paper and see that this is true that this this is the highest uh, profit they achieve if they produce qm not anything beyond it and another thing you have to look at is, is really is the marginal cost curve here and then margin revenue so additional units beyond this point are more expensive so marginal cost is higher than the margin revenue so this distance is a loss basically per unit although average cost stays still uh, beyond uh, below the average cost average revenue but then additional units are actually eating into that extra uh, that additional profit here that's made by the difference between the average revenue and major cost average cost so they should uh, monopolists should stick to this rule as a result marginal cost equals marginal revenue rule yeah that allows them to maintain that more uh, huge uh, what do you call this huge uh, super normal profits in the market so that's the total revenue area so the, this times that area gives us the uh, the uh, 
total profits. Now, quick question. The diagram shows a monopoly. Which letter gives the profit maximizing price? By now, you, you should be able to answer this question. Uh, definitely not E, right? It's the point where marginal cost marginal revenue equals, but it's the point for determining the Q. For determining the price, we have to trace out further up here, and that's point here A on the average revenue curve, the demand curve here. It's this A is the one uh, where a profit maximizing price is set. Okay, that's A. Now, the question is, which uh, for, a cost, for customers or consumers, which market structure is more beneficial? Which is socially optimal in our goals? We'll, we'll discuss that next week, but uh, for the sake of uh, sort of simplicity, I say socially optimal in the sense that benefits the cust customers or consumers most. Now, let's take a case of monopoly. And let's uh, first fix the points where monopolists operate. These are the two points, the price one, P1, and then Q1. And as you can see, this corresponds to the point where they maximize their profit. So they produce Q1 units uh, selling at P1 by, uh, by producing at the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And if you remember, uh, for, uh, for a, a perfectly comp a a firm for a firm that's in the perfectly competitive industry, uh, the, uh, the the profit maximizing unit or profit maximizing point is not marginal revenue equals marginal cost. It's the point where marginal cost equals average revenue. Remember, the price equals marginal cost was the price uh, was the case here. Here in this case, in this curve, this marginal revenue is not actually uh, marginal revenue for perfectly competitive firm. It's marginal revenue for only monopoly. So we don't we don't go by this rule here. We we look at the average revenue and we assume that for monop uh, perfectly competitive firm, margin revenue is equal to average revenue in this case. So in that case, uh, let's trace out what they are, what the points of uh, of a firm that's operating in the uh, perfect competition. And remember, we said the rule is they produce at the point where marginal cost equals price, and that's equal to average revenue. Yeah, that's this point here. So a perfectly competitive firm will not operate here, they operate right there because their average revenue, margin revenue and demand curve is, is this point here. Now they are usually operating, uh, their demand curve is actually perfectly elastic which implies a horizontal line. So it's just put a horizontal line here, that's probably the best way to, to tell you about this, to put a horizontal line here, that's this point. In that case, as you can see, the more socially optimal way of, uh, more socially optimal structure is the com uh, perfect competition case because they produce more. Q2 here at a lower price, P2, while the other uh, monopolists produce at a higher price and a lower amount, so not enough. So it's an artificially creating this monopoly. So if you don't produce you know, enough quantities, then obviously prices go up. So there's a shortage of goods, so prices keep going up. You know, the, 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 the monopolist can put at any price that it wants. So that's P1. So that's an, a demonstration of uh, which market is superior or which. Now, uh, we will not cover this case where uh, the, um, the, uh, the marginal cost curves are different, so I'm going to skip that. Okay, what are the disadvantages of monopoly? And, um, as we know, uh, or we have just touched the base about this, in the short run and the long run, the prices remain high and the output is low in the monopoly. So it's a disadvantage. High prices, low output means there's always shortage of these goods. And it's not socially optimal as a result. And there is also lack of incentives to innovate. So if, um, if, a, market, if a company can uh, keep the prices high enough without having to innovate or come up, come up with the new, new products, obviously it doesn't produce then new products or it doesn't innovate because without innovation it can maintain the high prices, right? It's being the sole supplier of this type of good. So that's another disadvantage, lack of incentive to innovate. But in fact, many monopolists do invent and innovate as well. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. And it also leads to X, X inefficiency. That's the case when if a firm, if a monopoly uh, doesn't operate on the point where it could operate and it could be more efficient, but it is. Uh, it doesn't usually do so because it, there is no incentive for doing that. You know, it operates at a at a at a, at a point which is which entails higher prices and lower quantities, and that's the case of X inefficiency. 
Now, what are the advantages? Nevertheless, there are some advantages. The monopoly will maintain or can, can have an economies of scale that other firms do not have. That employs, it could produce at a lower cost, but it may not as a result. But that's the advantage that it can have it. Because under perfect competition, there is no economies of scale, which means the prices will be, although uh, at the lowest, uh, the companies cannot reduce the costs as easily. So, but monopoly can, being the sole producer, can innovate and gain more economies of scale. That's the advantage of that. And profits, if a monopoly is a good monopoly, can be invested. Reinvested, reinvestment means uh, more innovation. More innovation means more benefit for the population. And at the same time, high profits may encourage risk taking. You know, the company may try to invest more into uh, building new, 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 new types of products by taking risk. For example, Elon Musk, for example, just put a rocket at the, uh, or the, the, his what we call this his uh, car into uh, into space, deeper space, outer space. Uh, it is he. They are mostly well. They are monopoly in space tourism or space space thing but he's monopolizing the uh, a certain segment of space uh, industry that is the heavy goods uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, what do you call this heavy goods delivery space uh, industry for example if, if we set up something in, in, in Mars for example most likely that given that they've been already established in the market they will be dominating it by the time we have the Mars uh, habitation established uh, Elon Musk will have it in a, in the best way of will have the best way of delivering the goods there at the lowest cost, right? So he's taking now risks to to go to that point, and he knows that he has that vision that in about ten years we'll have some people living on Mars, so, so they need to be delivered to air, water, and things like this. So he wants to dominate it and increase it, improve the efficiency in space tourism. So that's one thing, but not not every monopoly is like an Elon Musk company, right? Okay, uh, that's for that's it for uh, monopoly.